What's going on guys? My name is Alden Nero and welcome to episode 12 of my review series for 13 Reasons Why. Only one reason to go after this one and uh, this is the penultimate episode that I've been really looking forward to doing and I finally got the chance to watch it just now and holy shit. Yeah, I came home from work and I was like, man, I gotta find out what Hannah says about Mr. Porter in this tape. Uh, only to find that I was completely wrong and he is not the subject of this tape. As always, if you're watching on YouTube, you know, leave a like or a comment. It's pretty cool to see the feedback, even though obviously interest dies out over the course of a series, and that's true of every single series. Um, I got really lucky with episode one, and there's no way that every episode was going to end up as, uh, as, as well received as that one in terms of its viewership and stuff. But uh, if you are still here and you are enjoying it, sure, leave a like because uh, I would appreciate it. And if you don't, I'm going to come after you with a series of cassette tapes and I'm going to mail them to all your friends and stuff and it's going to make ultimately no sense, but there you go. Anyway, let's get into this review. This episode starts off with some really strange noises and flashing images and it's not the first time that this show has used that technique to kind of throw you off, make you unsure about what you're actually watching, whether or not this is a flashback or a dream sequence, because these images do take place before Clay wakes up in his bed. Was that the product of his dream, you're supposed to ask? But, you know, this show makes you very cynical um, about its characters. And when I was watching it, I thought to myself, there is no way that this is a flashback or a dream sequence. This is going to be uh, the real deal. Um... What kind of real deal? You're not sure, but given that it's episode 12 and we're getting closer and closer to completing all of the reasons why, and generally in a situation like this, the reasons why are going to get darker and darker each time. Uh, but we learn about that as the episode goes on. Uh, we learn that the subpoenas are going out today, and they've been issued to Clay, Courtney, Zach, and Alex. I like the word subpoena because it's a word that they seem to just throw into any show that contains law references whatsoever. I'd love to make a law show where like the main guy's name is Affidavid Subpoena and he's like an Italian or Latin guy and um, he's, his sidekick is like Will Testimonio or some. Anyway, I don't know why I, I said that. I'm, I'm very excited. Um, Justin is really concerned about all these subpoenas going out and he asks Alex if he's freaked. Alex, surprisingly enough, doesn't care, uh, which is his default response to everything because he's the most depressed kid on the planet. But um, I do really like Alex as a character. I, I actually think he's awesome. We see Bryce calling Justin to pretend that he doesn't know that he raped Jessica and... Bryce is like, come on, man, I don't know what went wrong the other night. I love you, man. And it's it's really weird. Like, I'm not saying it's bad. Bryce is a really, really good predatory sociopath. And he, the actor who plays him does the role so well that I think if I saw him in real life, I would be a little bit afraid of what he's capable of. Elsewhere in school, Courtney and Marcus start plotting and scheming, trying to get everyone to get their stories straight when Tyler approaches them and says he wants in on their group. Monty comes down the stairs in the school and from seemingly out of nowhere, just pushes Tyler over for basically no reason whatsoever before Bryce intervenes and pulls Monty away. Tyler looks like he's going to explode here. And I wonder if he's going to play a key role in unveiling the truth or in my original notes, I had a joke written down here and it actually came true in this episode. So we'll get to that point. Um, but this is a really tense start to the episode in all seriousness. Everything that's happening here is happening with real urgency. There's this continuous beat in the soundtrack that's reminiscent of either a beating heart or a ticking clock. But either way, it's something that is symbolic of the pressure these kids feel that they're under, particularly Marcus and Courtney, right? Because those two are the ringleaders of the let's all get our stories straight mentality. And the reason for that is because of their reputation in the school. And um, I guess it's because their futures are sort of set in stone. They're these uh, really high achieving kids. They socially engineer their way to where they are and stuff like that. Um, so they feel like they've got the most riding on just a clean slate in school where they can move on to their um, 
high level degree and they're high paying jobs and all of that stuff so to them this is like the biggest deal ever they're only capable of viewing it through a selfish lens obviously courtney also wants to keep her secret that she's a lesbian um yeah marcus actually does seem worse than courtney but they are definitely really really bad people um and they have the chance to atone for their sins so we'll see if that does happen in this um but yeah it's it's just a super tense start and it was really well done like you could sort of feel a, a nail-biting tendency or, or like it was building to a sort of an edge-of-your-seat type drama. Um, it kind of concludes, um, the, the tension kind of concludes with Jessica walking into a room and finding Justin just sitting there waiting. She asks him how he could have let Bryce do what he did and he tries to excuse himself and he bigs Bryce up as some sort of great friend, much to Jessica's disdain. And it's interesting in this moment because Justin says... Um, that Bryce was there for him when he had nothing. When he was kicked out of his house, he didn't have shoes to play basketball. Uh, he didn't have enough money for books. His mum wouldn't talk to him. His mum was caught for possession and, and all of this stuff. And that Bryce stuck his neck out for Justin and that Bryce um, helped Justin, like, you know, he helped him have as normal a life as he could. And Jessica really interestingly says, that's how they own you. And it's really true. That That's pretty much the kind of guy that Bryce is and Justin can't see it because Justin the way his character is in this show is that he's he's not very bright at all he, he's quite stupid uh, he follows his instincts and his emotions which would be a sort of um, a really valuable trait if he were a good character but because he comes from a broken home and he's being steered by all of these people around him to do certain things and react in certain ways he comes across as a bad guy and that's just the way that it is clay sits in monet's and starts listening to cassette 12 this will be the first time that we hear hannah's voice in this episode and she says we're gonna start at the beginning of the worst day of her life and me in my infinite cynicism made a mental note here and I was like which day is she goddamn talking about but it turns out she's actually talking about a new day that we haven't even uh, witnessed yet and it starts in the pharmacy with Andy reading an eviction notice out loud Hannah offers up her college fund to supplement the business but um Olivia says absolutely no way um, Olivia says she needs to take the money to the bank to make a deposit and Hannah offers her services for this she says I will do the, de the bank deposit for you uh, they agree to it and then she leaves the building and calls Clay the call distracts her and she ends up leaving the bag with the money in it on top of her brand new massive jeep that her dad bought her for her prom night um, and then she drives away note that she is driving this particular car while her dad just received an eviction notice <laughs> she is driving the brand new fucking jeep while her dad reads an eviction note like just sell the fucking car god almighty you could avoid so many of these problems with a little sprinkling of common sense anyway we see the bag falling in the road as she drives away and she goes to visit clay at the cinema and they have a really dull conversation that's just laced with residual angst clay is obviously still reeling from the loss of a good friend and hannah is just wrecked with guilt over what happened in jessica's room and they make small talk uh clay is behind the sort of ticket booth at the cinema his voice is a little bit more muffled and it's just not a clean conversation at all um after the small talk they go their separate ways and it clicks for hannah that the bag is missing the camera pans here to a ghostly looking present day clay um who closes out the scene and he looks like a heroin addict with a hangover here clutching his bike as if it were a shopping cart he walks into the pharmacy and buys some choice products nerds sweethearts and blue nail varnish if you don't know what nerds are they are magical sweets that you eat like oceans of when you're younger and then when you get older you realize that they're actually like really bad for you i i had some recently though and they were great and they served them in my local shop uh, outside my work and I think I'm probably gonna buy some tomorrow just because that product placement works in school Tony meets Clay uh, he seems to have been waiting for him um, and they were like it's pretty obvious they have some kind of plan on the go here but Clay won't let Tony in on what it is but Tony gives Clay a different Walkman and it's at this moment I realized that the nail varnish is for the tapes because the numbers on the tapes are written in blue. Um, I wasn't sure what the plan was, but I will say that I am very intrigued to see how it plays out. Okay, so the next scene is Tyler literally buying a gun. I actually cannot believe that this is happening. I, like, <laughs> I am 
as I was watching this show, in my notes, I wrote, I cannot believe that this is happening. Like, I predicted it in literally his first appearance in the show. But, oh my fucking god. When he's done buying a fucking gun, he goes to Monet's to speak to everyone else who's been subpoenaed. Ryan, Marcus, Courtney, Zach, and Alex? I think that's everyone. They're all in there. Um... Tyler claims he's deserved his seat at the table, and he ends up forcing his way in. Courtney leads the story that they're all going to tell. The others learn that Justin confronted Bryce about the rape scene, uh, which we uh, saw in the last episode, and there's a real strong sense of urgency here as this scene goes on too. Tyler suggests turning Bryce in and asks why they haven't just done that already. Marcus claims he's just protecting himself and his future, like I mentioned earlier. Tyler furthers his angle and suggests that they all band together and just sacrifice Bryce, cut him loose and give him up to the police. The gang mulls over the prospect of doing this, and Alex stands out here um alex turns into an island of reality in an ocean of bullshit in this scene and he buries every single person at the table saying that the tapes were right and then he names like he just he, he drops everyone's name and he's like tyler you're a stalker uh, ryan you're an asshole and all of this stuff and it's really really great he, he really bosses the scene he, he just calls on everyone to tell the truth, and they all seem to lean in favour of this, apart from Marcus and Courtney. Tyler also objects, but he gets beaten into silence by Courtney, who I imagine will be his first victim if he gets going with that gun. Back at the pharmacy, Olivia asks Tony for help with the blueprint. Like, you know, the blueprint slash mind map thing that she found in Hannah's possessions in the last episode. And Tony really drops the ball here. He has no card left to play. Tony has been the helpful little, like, do-gooder guy who uh, constantly tells everyone what they want to hear and stuff like that. Um, But Olivia is not buying his confusion in this scene, and it ends in a really sour note. It seems as though their bridges have been burned by this, and Tony's seeming refusal to help. Olivia must be wondering what the fuck went on, by the way. Like, she must be so flabbergasted, and if she does find out about the tapes, she's going to be like, infinitely more confused. In the follow-up scene, Tony tells Brad about some of the stuff that's been going on with him, and it's clear that he's just out of ideas here as to how to proceed. He can't keep going on being the mystical Yoda figure because he's been rumbled now, and this is actually an important part of his character progression because... He really could do with being more open. We then go back to the aftermath of Hannah's mistake with her parents yelling at her for losing the bag. Their response is like the classic parental devastation of being told, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. But it really removes from her self-worth and there obviously wasn't much there to begin with because of the state of her self-esteem. But she says that no matter what she did, it just felt like she was letting everyone down. And she went on a walk all around Liberty City. Where <laughs> Liberty City, hmm, where have I heard that before? Um, she kind of wanders into Bryce's house where there's a party going on. And Clay follows in her footsteps as usual. He knocks on Bryce's door and asks Bryce if he can buy some weed. Then we go back to Hannah's story. She walks in along the pool. Jessica urges her to get into the hot tub, which she does. Then we go back to the present where Bryce says he's going to give Clay the weed for free. Clay brings up Hannah, saying that she once told him about one of her parties. Well, one of Bryce's parties. One of her appearances at Bryce's party. We flash back again and Hannah is abandoned in the hot tub, only to be joined by Bryce. She motions to leave and Bryce overpowers her. And this scene is tough to watch. He turns her around and we all know where this is going. We go back to the present day where Clay tells Bryce that he raped Hannah. He's like... You raped Hannah, didn't you? Bryce doesn't rise to this and he plays the she wanted it card before Clay punches him right in the face. But Bryce is completely unfazed by this. He completely levels Clay and leaves him in a bloody heap. Then the rape scene continues after and it is just fucking horrible to watch. Like, it is some seriously grim television. It's juxtaposed really well by Clay's lifeless body fighting for breath and the sidewards shot of Bryce pouring some victory whiskey. It's some nice directing, you can't deny, but you really just have a sick feeling watching this whole thing. It's just horrible. Clay crawls onto the armchair in Bryce's foyer, which earns Bryce's respect. Bryce gives him a whiskey or whatever it is that he's drinking, and the way Clay positions his bag on the ground makes it pretty obvious that he's recording Bryce. I keep on going to call him Bryce, that's really annoying. 
Anyway, Bryce should really have known because Clay's persistence here is palpable. He's like, you did it, didn't you? I just need to hear you say it. Just say it. Just say that you did it. And the big dumb idiot basically fucking admits to it anyway. Uh, we see Clay having a celebratory yell as he cycles away from Bryce's house. It feels like a minor victory. Um, I don't think there's anything they could have done after the rape scene to sort of bring back any sense of, you know, positive emotion through this episode because I I don't know, like this episode started off with a warning saying that some people may find this, uh, you know, um, insensitive or, or whatever it is. And like, that's fairly true. Just the way Bryce acts, like his callousness, his complete lack of regard and his lack of remorse, um, I don't know, it's horrible to watch. He just looks like a guy that you would fear. Um, I don't, it, it's great acting, uh, and, and like he, he's very good at playing the character, but goddamn, is this character a fucking scumbag. Elsewhere, Justin comes home to his apartment and finds that Seth is just sitting there in the dark waiting for him, angry that there's a subpoena in the post because it might interfere with his ability to deal drugs from the house. He attacks Justin, and Justin's mother intervenes, but doesn't really do anything. Justin just leaves. Jessica starts pouring out all her alcohol and scrubs herself clean. Elsewhere, Sherry begins her atonement. Earlier on in the episode, she called the cops to report herself. And now she sits next to the broken stop sign near tears. I should mention that while this is happening, there's a song playing in the background called The Killing Moon. I don't know who's covering it, but it's originally by Echo and the Bunny Men, and similar to their cover of uh, the Atmosphere song by Joy Division earlier on in this series, this kind of falls flat. There's one line in the chorus, he will wait until you give yourself to him, which I suppose is um, is a reference to Bryce, but it just doesn't sound right. I guess they couldn't get the license for the original song, or they didn't want to pay the fee or something like that, but like the original song would make so much more of an impact here I think Courtney comes clean to one of her dads about her history with Hannah and Zach ignores another call from Justin who is seen packing a bag and packing a gun Alex's dad tells him that he can probably get him out of the deposition and that he's a good kid and then Clay's mom realizes he's not at home and the scene gets interrupted by sirens and an EMT announcing that there's a 17-year-old kid with a gunshot wound to the head. This is a guy driving an ambulance. Then Hannah is seen at her desk saying, after she's done this this uh, mind map, this chart, or this, uh, this web of, of names, the connections, she says she's decided that nobody would ever hurt her again. And the episode closes out. And there are so many questions here. There's only one episode left. I would imagine there's not going to be a tape for anyone, but I also imagine we're going to get some some reference to Mr. Porter and what's going on with him because he there's something shady about him that I don't understand. Um, I really want and need everybody to turn on Bryce. I need more from the Bryce-Justin thing. Um, these aren't me, like, commanding the series. Like, I'm not saying, like, this is shit, they didn't do this. I'm saying I'm excited to see what happens in this last episode. Like, I think there's... I, I think it's going to be a, a pretty damn good conclusion because of the build. And uh, they've set up for just a really interesting payoff here. Um, and it has been a really good show so far. And this episode was, was very tense. It had a really noticeable change of pace from the last episode. And it's just pretty good. There are so many cards flipped upside down. Um, I don't know how it's going to play out and that excites me because usually usually with a series um, of this kind of ilk there's only one or two ways it can turn out. There are a lot of things that could happen here. We have no idea who has been shot in the head but we know it's a 17 year old kid. It could have been Tyler going and shooting Courtney. It could have been Tyler shooting any one of a number of kids. It could have been Justin going to shoot Bryce. It's really important that they gave that scene of Justin picking up the gun because Justin shooting Bryce would make a hell of a lot of sense because he's emotional, uh, he just reacts based on these basic instincts that he has in his head. Um, it's a way of getting everybody, like, not off the hook, but, I mean, it's a way of never proving the tapes correct 
because Bryce would never see justice. I don't know. There's a lot to that, but I believe that this show is making me think that that's the case when in fact it's something completely different. And I don't know what it could be. If I had to guess, I would say something to the effect of Tyler shooting himself in the head or something like that. I don't know. I I have no idea how it's going to go. Um, and I don't like going on record and making predictions when it really could be one of a number of things. So, um, I hope you guys appreciate that. Anyway, I thought this episode was really, really good. Um, and I think the scene involving Hannah goes a long way to contextualizing her suicidal revenge quest and how odd that is and how... You know, if you watch the first five episodes of this show and that's it, what you're going to take away from it is that this woman had some other form of mental illness where her vanity was the only important thing in her life. Um, But it doesn't end that way at all. It goes a long way to explaining how she could go from what she is, you know, in, in, in all the pre-drama and and pre-horror version of Hannah to this woman that's like fuck all of y'all I am out and a lot of you are are going down as a result of it um and, and that's interesting it's it's definitely like there's definitely something a little bit unnerving about it for sure but it's also just a character arc I haven't really seen before there's one instance of this I can think of on tv um, where it's in the show Home and Away, where there was a cop called Jack, and he was going out with a girl called Samantha, and she decided to kill herself and frame it on Jack as one last fuck you because she thought that he was cheating on her. Something like that. And I thought that was insane at the time, but that was on a soap called Home and Away. This is on, uh, this is not primetime television, it's on Netflix, which is probably more important than primetime television. Anyway, I feel like I've rambled a lot here. Um, overall, a good episode, and I'm very excited for the last one. I hope you guys are excited for it too. If you are, please leave a like on the video. I've been Elden Hero. Thank you for listening.